be honest, how many of you thought to yourself that once you hit a certain rank in Overwatch, your suffering is going to end? Because let me tell you right here, there is no ELO heaven. We all have this romantic idea of reaching our new peak and things finally being different. Tanks that actually secure space, DPS that know how to land their shots, and supports that play Zen Brig, because it's meta. The big difference between mortal beings like us and top 500 players is really just that they can win matches while throwing. You and I usually have to choose one or the other, but everything you know and hate to have happen in your competitive matches does not go away at the highest rank in the game, and I am here to show you that. Today, you will witness the absolute clown fiesta that is top 500 in the current year, how two teams both go about throwing in their own rights for one to ultimately come out on top. But before we can delve into those depths, we need to see the light, the light in the form of our sponsor for today, Surfshark VPN. Hey, you guys seen the latest Attack on Titan episode? I didn't because it is freaking blocked in my region, is what I would say if I didn't have Surfshark VPN. Listen, I hate region locks as much as the next guy, but there's something ironic about a show not being available in Germany when a lot of the themes are ripped straight out of our history book. But you know where it is available? The United States. And thanks to Surfshark's intuitive software, I can make these gosh darn streaming platforms believe that this is where I'm watching from. Goodbye region locks and hello content libraries that I haven't had access to yet. If you want to get in on the content binge and save some money while you're at it, you can save 83% on your Surfshark subscription and get 3 extra months for free, simply by clicking my link in the description below and using my promo code Cliff Terrios. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to go and talk to my friends about how incredibly mid Attack on Titan is. Thanks a bunch to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video, and now, onto our standard programming. Anubis isn't a map that's fun to play at the best of times. I mean, there's a reason they are literally removing this game mode in Overwatch 2, but until that day comes, players made it their job to find means and ways of having a good time here. Zupo submitted this replay to show me what that would look like in the highest rank of the game. But wait, I know a lot of these people from my own matches! And I'm definitely not a GM player. I mean, we have long since known that Top 500 consists of about 24 streamers and their ult accounts, but it's starting at 3800 at the time of this match taking place really showed that. Regardless of that, every player in this lobby is still in order of magnitude more competent than me, so let's take a look at how they go about clowning their way to victory. There were a few surprises in the opening move of our heroes as they TP'd across the choke point for a rotation. The blue team remained steadfast in their positioning, awaiting the attackers for a strike, though I'm sure they were not expecting Striker to charge into all of them right from the get-go. It may appear reckless at first, but his entire team had his back, and in one fell swoop, they made their push. The enemy Ana desperately tried to back away as all their comrades died around them screaming, but no matter how good their aim was, there'd be no kills in their favor without ammo. Their diva was the last player standing, but even they had given up, submitting to the wrath of the red team as the first point was captured, and with that, Zupo and friends were off to a fantastic start. The combination of speed boost and teleporter really did wonders for their ability to rotate and catch the enemy team off guard, but the defenders had not given up entirely. A tactical swap to May allowed them a better chance of stopping the snowball, cutting Striker off the rest of his team before deleting him. But they were already in Zupo's web, they just didn't know it yet. His teleporter kept no bit for the ice wall, getting the rest of his team in position to deal massive surprise damage as the defenders focused on deleting Striker. Eliminations began pouring in, and say what you might about Fan the Hammer, but if it's good enough for a top 500 player, it should be good enough for you. Meanwhile on the point, Jake Haru was wreaking havoc against the split defenders who desperately tried to avoid the embarrassment of an instant sweep. The blue Reinhardt figured it was their responsibility to put an end to all that monkeying around, but let's not forget that a certain somebody was eliminated at the start of this fight, and that same somebody had a bone to pick with said blue Reinhardt. Try as they might, the defenders simply could not find their footing, whilst our heroes only picked up more and more steam the longer the fight lasted. I'm sure many of you know what that feels like from your own 2 CP matches, a sweep like this can easily ruin the mental of even the most positive team, so if they wanted to stay in the game, they needed ideas. But we all know how this game mode functions, one good round a winner doesn't make. Zupo was ready to welcome the attackers, having set up a nest of turrets alongside a contingency teleporter to get out of harm's way. The trap was triggered, but its usefulness could definitely be debated. The blue team had decided to take this path, turrets or not, so our heroes had to reply to that threat. And reply they did! What started off as a confident offense was turned around in an instant, as the red team decided to tape down their W keys to push the attackers back to whence they came! I would love to go more in detail about what exactly transpired in this fight, but it was about as chaotic as you could imagine. All you have to know is that Zupo and Striker were the only ones to fall. The only survivor on the blue team was that Tracer, and you can tell that our heroes no longer considered them a threat, as Jake Haru blew his ultimate just to slap them back to spawn. They would 
come to regret that decision because with no tanks on the front lines and no turrets to stall out the attack, the blue team could march on forward with little retaliation. What came out of this was a Reinhardt diff, a Lucio gap, and a capture point that no longer belonged to our heroes. It was time for the counter snowball now, so let's see if the blue team can replicate their enemy success without their honor. Because they definitely did not bother to wait for her. <laughs> Granted, I don't know how much of a difference they could have made because their Reinhardt had absolutely no intention to worry about things like line of sight, making him an easy first pick for the defenders. Their second tank didn't seem to be any more competent as he decided to fight Zupo's teleporter about as ferociously as I fight my crippling depression. So, not a lot. To make matters worse, his primal rage ended up helping aimbots to get in position to gather more eliminations. The monkey man decided to take a timeout in the shame corner instead of resetting, and if you think to yourself that it can't get worse than that, then well, just you wait. Naturally, the rest of the blue team was either eliminated or had disengaged, however, the capture points suddenly making progress in favor of their opposition definitely did not go unnoticed, but the red team had no intention to sit on the point. As soon as the monkey was taken care of, Zupo set up Striker for a massive high-risk, high-reward play, aka what we tell ourselves when we try to farm content. He was vengeance, he was the desert sun in the sky, he was... Batman. Striker dropped down from the heavens to enact bloody revenge, and I mean respect to his Reinhardt counterpart for seeing the shadow coming, but that did not help the rest of their team who were getting stomped into the ground. This is the definition of Overwatch ladder play, in which it doesn't matter if what you do is kinda stupid, as long as you do it together. And hey, what had proven once surely would work a second time, right? The attackers would never expect that he was to do something so stupid twice in a row, which is exactly why Aimbots was about to do it. It is worth mentioning that the blue team's monkey continued to be about as useful as a gym membership three months after New Year's, but what would Overwatch be if we didn't occasionally indulge in such degeneracy, am I right? Aimbot's attempted assassination failed to mimic Striker's success beforehand, leading to his entire team just blowing every ultimate they had at their disposal to make him feel like he helped. And guess who decided that he was too cool to join the team fight instead setting their primate butt on the capture point? Yeah, throwing can take many different forms it seems. The red team stopped even trying to hide what they were doing, teleporting in the face of the attackers to surprising effect. The timer continued to take down with no end to the this round in sight, unless. There are two simple truths at play here. Number one, the red team had wasted a lot of ultimates. And number two, the red team was not taking the blue monkey seriously. All of this clowning that our heroes engaged in gave the attackers an opening to empty their own ultimate bank, and with barely any Q buttons in reserve, things began to take a turn. The blue monkey used that opportunity to yeet over the choke straight to the capture point while the defenders were being kept busy. There was absolutely nobody around to stop him from making progress this time, and whoever survived the onslaught of ultimates wouldn't even even get to touch the points. Man, who would have thought that not taking your opposition seriously in a volatile game with such as 2CP could backfire? But don't worry guys, because there's a lot more clowning to come, so let's see who ends up winning the circus. Okay, so maybe some mistakes were made towards the tail end of that round, but by and large, our heroes were doing great. And much in the spirit of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, Zupa went to set up a nest once again. But while they were engaging in true and tested strategies, the blue team instead faked a rotation. Their monkey kept up the act of being willfully incompetent, baiting the defenders into a pincer that was met with an immediate counterattack. This brawl that the attackers baited our heroes into was a slow affair with no eliminations going either way, until their Hansa began pulling out the skill arrows to decimate any semblance of a lineup that was in front of them. This was a really weird fight to be honest, but yeah, the blue team took the first points. But don't worry guys, our hero's counterattack was imminent. There would be no snowballs in the desert under their watch, so if the blue team wants a piece of that pie, they better try harder than a single fake out. Our favorite throwing monkey made a desperate effort to secure as much as a single tick, but the red team knew not to fall for his tricks any longer. It did come as a bit of a surprise that after feeding so willingly so often, he was actually quite the escape artist when he wanted to be, even managing to escape the clutches of the defenders in time for the return of Azana to top him back up, which makes it ever the more unfortunate that the streak was ended by his sleep dart. Is it overkill to high noon a sleeping Winston that is about to get charged into the nether realm? Maybe, but I'm sure the red team found that a worthwhile investment. Striker and Zupo decide to pull out Ye Old Fateful one last time at the tail end of this round, and I mean, you can't really argue with results. Our heroes had succeeded in defending the second point, no ticks were given at the end of that fight, and that should give them the wood at the back of their sails to bring this match home. But desperate times, ask for desperate measures. The blue team decided to go for a bastion strat and a Hail Mary attempt at full holding. But for this to work, they needed to display a similar amount of positional creativity as our heroes, taking to the sky themselves to win this game after all. Our heroes noticed the play and saw how most of the team was nowhere near the objective, so they decided, I guess we'll just go there then? Insanity and brilliance are a lot closer related than you might assume, but in this case, the blue team had truly outplayed themselves. Up to 95% capture progress was made in sheer disbelief 
over how their enemies could have messed that up so horribly. The red team had time to spare and no more than a single fight was necessary to acquire the remaining 5% as the opposition was forcefully ejected off the point. And that is pretty much all she wrote. The red team was victorious and I gotta thank Zupa for his contribution and glimpse into the world of top 500. But if you want to see more unique strategies on display, make sure to check out my last episode in which we follow a Bastion Lucio duo on their journey to spawn camp their enemies. You can find the card on screen right now. But until then, thank you everybody so much for watching. Don't forget to drop me a like on your way out if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe if you want to see more and definitely ring that bell icon to not miss out on my next upload. I hope you guys have a fantastic day and until next time, peace.